Hello, readers. Coming up, it's my chat with Megan Sullivan and Paul Blaschko on The Good Life Method. First, I wanted to remind you to check out our website at booksonpod.com. While there, you can sort through past shows by episode number, book title, author's last name, or sort by category. For instance, select the history or philosophy category for episode number 73 with Ryan Holiday on Lives of the Stoics. Hey, I'm Ryan Holiday. I'm the author of Lives of the Stoics, The Art of Living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius. You're listening to Books on Pod with Trey Elling. We have a great conversation where we try to see what we can learn from the ancients and apply to our modern lives. Hello, readers. Megan Sullivan is the Wilsey Family College Professor in Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame and Director of the God and the Good Life program. Paul Blaschko is an assistant teaching professor in philosophy at Notre Dame and also intricately involved in the God and the Good Life program. Together, they just co-authored the excellent new book, The Good Life Method, reasoning through the big questions of happiness, faith, and meaning. Megan, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you. And Paul, thank you for the time. How are you? Yeah, doing really well. Thanks. Great to hear. So for anybody who is unfamiliar with the concept that this entire book is based around, Megan, what is the good life method? So Paul and I are philosophers. We're philosophy professors, and we're the kind of people that get paid to think about big questions all the time. And the premise of this book is that a lot of people have not had the chance to study or think about philosophy. Certainly, maybe if you're lucky, you could take one class in college on questions about the meaning of life and what it is to pursue the good life, but you probably have not had a lot of exposure to it. Uh, we think that everybody would benefit from knowing about Plato and Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas and all of the different uh, processes and methods that they offer us for thinking about what our goals and desires are and how we're getting happiness in our sights. So the premise of the book is you have philosophical questions already and you might not know that they're philosophy, but we're gonna show you how to see the philosophical thread running through your goals and also to give you some depth and realize that there are these really great thinkers from the last 2,400 years that you could use as resources as you try to live a good life. Y'all point out that humans all really started wondering philosophically about how to live better lives at around the same time, which is somewhere between 600 and 300 BC. Why is this, Paul? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It's it's a great historical question. Uh, Like, why did this seem to happen all at the same time? Uh, Some of it has to do with, you know, just the interplay between uh, the different thinkers. Obviously, that doesn't explain all of it, right? Because uh, Confucius is thinking about this stuff at the same time as Aristotle and Socrates. Uh, I think, you know, a general answer, and and I say this sort of as a non-historian, so this is kind of a non-answer, I suppose, but a general answer is, you know, I think human beings are curious. At at the beginning of uh, of the metaphysics, Aristotle says, look, all humans, well, he says all sort of men, I guess, depending on the translation, desire to know, by nature, desire to know, right? And the idea is just that in our nature, it's built into the kind of thing that we are, right? We're reasoning, reflective creatures. Uh, And we can't help but sort of look around the world and then look around sort of at our lives and ask questions like, why am I here? Uh, What's the purpose of all of this? And how do I get better at doing the sort of things that I want to do anyway? So uh, in a way, I guess I'll I'll punt on this and just say, I think it's a universal feature of human experience that once you start going through this and once you you build up cities and start thinking with other people, you stumble uh, across these kinds of questions. Megan, Aristotle's search began with the question, what is our function as humans? What do you think it is? So, uh, you know, this is, uh, I, I got quizzed yesterday by somebody who was up in my office. It was like, does anybody in the year 2022 still believe in human nature? As though it's this kind <laughs> of like very mysterious or metaphysical thing, which maybe it is. But I looked at it and I was like, everybody believes in human nature. Like everybody believes that they have a human nature. You just maybe don't call it that. But you wonder all the time, am I a good boss? Am I a good parent? Am I a good citizen of the United States? Uh, How can I do better? Should I try to go on a diet this year? These are all questions about what kind of thing we're aiming to be, or we hope to be, what kind of person we want to be. 
And for me, I think the function of a human being is first to wonder about these questions. I mean, my neighbor's dog does not, I think, lose a minute of sleep about whether he's a good dog. I don't think he really is, but he just doesn't worry about it. Whereas like everybody worries about it. I, you know, especially this time of year, New Year's, I'm wondering all the time if I'm the, the right kind of person. When I ask that question, I'm wondering about what it is to be a, the best functioning version of myself. And the answer that Aristotle and philosophy gives which is, you know, needs a little bit of coloring in is, all right, what are the things that I think would go into a really great life for somebody like me? My function is going to be developing my capacity for reason, developing like love and relationships, developing uh, courage and generosity and all the kinds of things that are going to make the story of my really short time here on planet earth an interesting and good one, not a tragedy, but one that's something to be proud of. And when we wonder about those questions, I think that's when we're, we're starting to dial in on what we think the function of our particular lives are. And as Paul mentioned, and a lot of philosophers have supposed, all human beings tend to end up with similar types of general goals when they, uh, when they set out asking those questions. It just like kind of looks really different if you're a 2022 person living in South Bend than if you're like a Spartan warrior 300 is the neighbor's dog just an incessant barker or something? Oh my God, he barks all the time. And as far as I can tell, he doesn't like, you know, this gets us into the Aristotelian question. What is what is the function of a dog? Because that helps us tell whether a dog is great, good, or, or not even a dog anymore. I think the function of a dog is to be loyal to their master, ideally to do some tricks, to be companionable with other dogs, to have a certain maybe dog shape. I watch the Westminster Dog Show every year. They're, they're meant to have a certain kind of bone structure. This dog is kind of yippy and definitely doesn't seem to be in shape, does not seem to be particularly obedient or to take very much joy in his social life with my neighbor. So I think it's probably like a B minus dog. That's what? mean. I should, I, my neighbor's probably going to listen to your podcast and think like, oh no. Well, look, unfortunately, like with uh, really bad kids, it falls back on the parent or the owner in this instance. So the owner is clearly failing in ways that uh, unfortunately are affecting you. So chapter one of the good life method is desire the truth. Paul, y'all make the argument that bullshit keeps us from the good life. Why is that so? Yeah, good. And, and the notion of bullshit that we have in mind is a technical one. It's kind of fun. Harry Frankfurt came up with this idea of bullshit a few years ago. And so now at philosophy conferences, we all get to say bullshit all the time uh, <laughs> in the different sessions. The idea is, is you know, bullshit is, is speaking, is, is sort of making claims without any sort of concern about whether or not they're true. Uh, so it's the sort of thing that, you know, I might do in a conversation with my parents if I just want to like sort of intellectually dominate, right? You're, you're at Thanksgiving, you think like, ah, like I just want to be right. I want to win this argument no matter what. Or if I'm running for political office and I say like, ah, you know, in the next four years, there's going to be a catastrophe. I don't care if it's true or not. I just want power, right? Uh, so the idea is, you know, this is incompatible with the good life in a couple of different senses. Uh, individually, it's incompatible with the good life because if we're right, you know, part of our function as human beings is to reflect and to use reason to guide our lives. And to do that, you've got to be in touch with reality, right? Uh, both because, you know, if you're not, you're going to be frustrated by the world in various ways. You're going to go out and think like, oh, I can do all these things that you actually can't do. Um, but also because it's just an important part of having relationships with other people. If I don't care about the truth, right, then I'm just not going to be able to uh, connect in the right sort of way with my wife or my kids or, or you know, friends uh, elsewhere. There's another way in which uh, bullshit is incompatible with the good life. Uh, and this is a more communal way, right? Uh, sort of a community-based way. And this is something that I'm really interested in where, you know, we talk about this a lot in the book, uh, in part because I think philosophy can provide us with the tools for creating this sort of community that leads to uh, uh, flourishing in, in this particular way. So let me, let me like sort of explain this a little bit. Um, the idea is, look, as creatures, we desire to know, right? Uh, and one of the, the most enjoyable, pleasurable things, really, is to pursue and then attain the truth with somebody else, right? It's sort of like playing uh, like a cooperative board game. I didn't know these existed until like two years ago. Uh, my brother's like, do you want to play this board game? Actually, it was pandemic. Uh, ew, yeesh bad timing. Uh, but it's playing this cooperative board game, right? So instead of like pitting myself against an opponent, right, uh, in, in trying to debate and trying to like sort of figure out, you know, uh, who wins in this argument that we're having, uh, if you can think about pursuing the truth as an a joint endeavor and you think like, look, 
I really want to know the truth. It could be about something really obscure about rock formations or about, you know, some geometrical proofs. I don't know. I'm a philosopher. I don't know. I don't know math. Uh, but when you find that truth, right, when you connect, and especially when you connect on, on the truth about things that really matter deeply for the life of a community or the life of a family, there's a certain joy. There's a certain just uh, uh, energy that you get from that. And doing that with other people is part of what it is, we claim, and Aristotle claims, to flourish, to, to live well, to live a good life. Uh, and you can't do that if you're a, a sort of habitual bullshitter. Megan, is the best way to combat bullshit to just try and address things head on with the person who's spewing it? No. Oh my gosh. This is why like Paul, if Paul and I have, we have a bunch of takeaways from this book, but if there's one thing we want to convince you of early on, if you're the kind of person that's feeling really frustrated having conversations about the good life or democracy or religion with your friends and family right now is you need to read a little bit of Greek philosophy because they had exactly the same problem. Hmm. Uh, they lived in a culture where, as Paul mentioned, being able to win debates and persuade people with speeches was critical. It was how all decisions got made. And so there were, were tons of bullshitters and just like a lot of really aggressive arguers, like in your face kind of arguers, people trying to sell you stuff. And one of the things that we, uh, we learn really clearly from Socrates and Plato is that it's very hard if you're engaging with people who are on like high alert to argue to convince them to lower their guard or to care about the truth or care about the conversation by using argument. It's just like, it's like trying to put out a fire by throwing gasoline on it. It's like, it's feeding into the exact dynamic that's making it really hard for you guys to coordinate and care about the truth. So what we learn from Socrates and from Plato is rather than get like observing that this isn't working, uh, and then realizing that you don't have to be frustrated or just give up, you have other options. And one of the key options we learn from Socrates is how to ask better, more interesting, and more open-ended questions that don't presuppose that you're going to have a fight with the person, but you're just generally trying to get some more information and ideas out on the table, hopefully in a way toward, towards figuring out jointly which of those is true. I think I, I've been reflecting a lot on how much advice we've gotten over the past year about how to convince friends and family members that disagree with us to come over to our side. This is like an op-ed, I think, every week in the New York Times right now. <laughs> it's a lot about convincing other people rather than asking the more philosophical question of how to work with other people to figure out what's right about the relevant topic rather than coming into it presupposing that, that you've got all the worthy knowledge and you need to beat somebody else over the head with it. Paul, and I think uh, another way to go at that, other than believing that you're going to sway somebody to come to your side, is maybe go into that conversation, along with those open-ended questions that Megan just talked about, with the uh, hope that you maybe have a better understanding of why they feel the way that they do as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is something that, that you know, I, I immediately think about my relationship with my mom. And in the book, we, we you know, we, we go through a lot of personal stories and we sort of offer these as illustrations of the different views we're considering. But my mom and I, you know, one way, like our love language is, is arguing. Uh, you know, she was raised in this big Catholic Irish home and around the dinner table, like I, I even remember just like, you know, going to, to my grandma and grandpa's, and we were all just like pounding the table and I don't, I don't even know why. Uh, but this is how you show love for each other, right? Um, but, but part of the idea here is that the inner life of the people that you care about is something that you should care about, right? Knowing why they believe what they do, or even just how they see the world, right, uh, is a way of, of loving them. And actually, in the chapter uh, on love, uh, we talk a bit about this, right? We talk a bit about how empathizing with somebody and putting yourself in their position is a critical feature of love. Love isn't just about, you know, getting people gifts and, and sort of doing stuff for them. Uh, part of it is just understanding their mind, like where are they coming from? Uh, and that, as, as with a lot of the things that we're talking about here, that requires a particular trait, right? Aristotle would call it a virtue or an excellence, right? Uh, and here we might say, you know, uh, uh, the virtues, the relevant virtues are, you know, it's in part curiosity, it's in part uh, love of the other person and of the truth, uh, but cultivating those things that's a skill, right? That's something, according to Aristotle, and, and you know, we take this very seriously, uh, that's something that you can work on, that you can become better at. Uh, and so part of the big promise uh, of philosophy, I think, is that uh, we can become better people just by isolating out, okay, what are those traits that we need, right? Uh, and why are we sort of desiring them in the first place? How is this going to better our lives? Is it going to like, you know, create 
sort of closer connections with people we love, et cetera. And then how do we actually habituate ourselves? How do we acquire the habits to actually go out and do that, right? Uh, and I think that's deeply practical. A lot of people think of philosophy as this really sort of abstract, highfalutin stuff, and, and it is that. Uh, but it's also this deeply practical uh, way of thinking about, you know, how to love people better, uh, sort of as, as one example. Megan, why do philosophers love caves as a metaphor? We hate caves. It's the big thing you got to, if you remember anything from Plato, the whole point of philosophy is to realize you're in a cave and then try to get out of it as quickly as possible. The, the cave is a metaphor, this really famous metaphor from the Republic that philosophers for the next 2000 years take up as, uh, as kind of their symbol. The cave is a place where, uh, it's a place of deception. It's a place where you might be comfortable. And for Plato, where you see kind of simulations of things that are real, you see shadows of trees and animals, and you suppose that that's all there is in the world. But uh, because you don't know any better, you're actually missing out on the reality that's outside of the cave, uh, which is more bright, more beautiful. It's full of real things. It's, it's in living technicolor. It's a little bit painful to go from inside the cave to outside the cave. If you've, ever, if you've you know, ever gotten up in the middle of the night in your house and suddenly flipped all the lights on really fast, it's blinding at first to have to change how you're seeing. Um, but then it's awesome. Like You see so much more. And Plato says the... The goal of philosophy is through this process of asking questions, uh, of uh, practicing the right kind of skepticism, but also really desiring to know, not just wanting to destroy, but also wanting to, to see what's really there, we, uh, we make our lives better. We, we, we transform the way that we can live. And Plato talks about it in a kind of, uh, as, as Paul would say, highfalutin way. <laughs> but this idea that we're stuck in a cave and we really need to get out of it, um, people have found just inspiring through different eras of human history. So you see Plato and the allegory of the cave coming up when St. Augustine talks about undergoing a religious conversion and just trying to start to see, starting to see the world inflected with his religious faith. You see it in W.B. Du Bois, who writes about how uh, he felt like he was educated in this cave of racism and white supremacy where he was just taught that he would always have inferior intellectual abilities because of his race. And then he traveled outside the United States in the 30s and realized, holy cow, there are all kinds of flourishing, amazing black communities outside the United States. I've been fed these shadows and these lies, which have been really destructive. And it, you know, it takes a while to shift your mindset, but then you realize like, oh my gosh, there's a new way of seeing the world. So philosophers, when they're operating at their best, are trying to induce this kind of fear of missing out in people. Like you might be really comfortable that you're you're living the good life, you understand justice, you understand what your goals are right now. But if you probe a little further, you might see that there's kind of this tantalizing light off in the horizon that you could be moving towards and it's worth going after. Chapter two of the good life method is live generously. This deals with financial wealth. Just how important is financial wealth for the good life, Paul? I think it's certainly important to think about. Uh, so so I, I'll make a distinction here. I, I don't think you have to be wealthy to live a good life, right? Uh, but I do think you have to think really hard about uh, uh, material wealth and the role that it's going to play in your life and the role that pursuit of it's going to play in your life. We contrast uh, two views in this chapter. One is the virtue ethics view that, that we're defending. I'll say, I guess, a little bit about that in a second. But another one is, is a consequentialist view, right? Uh, so a view that the way to sort of you know, live ethically with respect to money is just to make as much of it as you can and then just give it away, right? And, and, and uh, find the worst consequences out there in the world that you can mitigate with money, right? Can you, you know, uh, solve uh, uh, really you know, intense poverty? Uh, can you help uh, aid people with serious illnesses? Now, we're not gonna disagree that that's important. Of course, that's important. We think that's really important. We also think uh, there are other ways of thinking about our relationship to money and to the good things in life that we really care about and value. So think about two different lives, right? Here, here are two different lives that, uh, well, I'll say I could have lived. I don't know if I could have actually lived this, but so I, I could have, you know, out of undergrad, uh, uh, tried to go to Wall Street and get a job as an investment banker, make as much money as I could and just give that away, right? And if I didn't have a family, maybe I could do that even more efficiently and just like make a bunch of money. Uh, on the other hand, you know, at least for me, I certainly thought, you know, 
living in close proximity to other human beings that I'm related to and that, that you know, my good is bound up with their good in a certain way, that's a really important thing for me, right? That, that's, that's a way in which I would flourish. If I didn't have that in my life, I wouldn't flourish. And it's important to note that this is both an ethical decision that I have to make and a financial decision, right? In, in choosing to have a family, you are foregoing this other possibility, making a bunch of money uh, and donating all of that money, right? And so the important thing here is just uh, to realize that there's that ethical dimension, right? That there's that other dimension uh, at play and that philosophy can help us sort through really hard questions there. Now, again, I think, you know, somebody who goes that first route I described, they're heroic in a way, right? There's almost a... a I don't know, like a, a, a sort of self-giving, almost saintly quality to somebody who's willing to sacrifice uh, a lot of things that you know people would think are very good in order to, to you know solve something that they think uh, is incredibly important. But the really important thing for us is that uh, is that you know there are real sort of trade-offs, there are real questions there, uh, and philosophy is something that can help us think seriously about those. And you said consequentialism. Y'all also call that effective altruism in this book, correct? Yeah, good. So, so effective altruism, the way to think about it is just, it's, it's a version of consequentialism. So consequentialism is this view that, you know, when you're making uh, ethical decisions, the thing that matters is the consequence, right? And effective altruists are uh, one branch of that. They say, yes, that's right. So you should make as much money as you can and donate it, uh, at least if you live, you know, in, in, in a society like ours and, and inhabit a certain sort of social structure, et cetera. Gotcha. Um, thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Megan, do you ag agree? Is there any validity to the criticism that virtue ethicists operate on a sort of self-centered morality? Yeah, I mean, an objection that uh, that a consequentialist would raise to Paul's reasoning just now is Paul is willing to to buy awesome Christmas presents for his beautiful kids and to really make a lot of sacrifices to ensure that they have a really wonderful life. But that means that there are other people's kids in like South Sudan who are dying um, because they don't have access to basic uh, medical care or to clean water or to anti-malarial drugs. The kind of things that the effective altruists will say, like, think about those kids. They're just as real. Somebody loves them. They have good lives as well. Um, and that gets us into this bigger objection that virtue ethicists have been facing since Socrates and Plato which is that the, the view makes you focus entire, your, your moral life is totally focused on achieving your personal goals, your Paul goals or Trey goals, rather than thinking about the good of the universe as a whole. Um, and so that's a serious challenge that virtue ethicists have to wrestle with. And there, there are a couple different ways that we could reply to the challenge. First, I think that uh, thinking about the good or the ethical from the standpoint of the entire universe, it's, it's selfless in a certain way, but not in a good way because it just like makes the, like reduces the universe into just uh, units of happiness or well being or quality adjusted life years, but ignores the fact that happiness and well being and extended life happens in the context of a particular person and their life and the complicated details and their free choices. So, one, just thinking that the, the standpoint of the universe is obviously superior from the standpoint of the individual requires a lot more philosophical argument than those utilitarians typically give us in a theoretical level. But the second point is being a virtue ethicist does not mean that you, uh, you only think about the interests of your immediate like biological family members and you ignore the interests of other people. In fact, it might be that in reflecting philosophically on what it means to be a really great parent, Paul realizes that one of the best things he could do for his children is to not give them Christmas gifts and instead to show them what it means to donate money to, uh, to children who are in need in another part of the world. But the difference is gonna be Paul's like moral credit or the fact that he's doing well by these decisions is not gonna be measured on how many people he saves or some external personless metric. Instead, it's gonna be judged on what were Paul's reasons? What was he aiming at in showing his children when they decided to donate all of their income this year to an anti-malarial charity? Like what's the story that Paul is telling and how is it affecting the other people whose lives he's tied up with? Um, and we think that that model is, is just, as, like, just as helpful in making decisions as consequentialism. Uh, and also the, the kind of self-centeredness that virtue ethicists are recommending to us 
is not, uh, shouldn't be understood as the, the really bad kind of selfishness. Um, th those are two different ideas. Chapter three of the good life method is take responsibility. I'm glad we were just talking about kids and Christmas, Paul, because personal accountability is a big one for me. That along with honesty are two of the most important lessons that I try to impart on my children. Why is taking responsibility so important for the good life? Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons. You know, one is that uh, you need a certain amount of self-knowledge uh, if you want to acquire the kinds of virtues that, that we think are really important uh, to have, right? You can't be self-deceived, and yet it's very easy to be self-deceived. Uh, one of the techniques that we recommend, and this is based, you know, loosely on um, uh, something that, that Elizabeth Anscombe, one of my very favorite philosophers uh, from the 20th century, uh, thinks about and writes about. One of the techniques that we recommend here is thinking really hard about the kinds of stories that you tell about your actions and about yourself, right? Uh, a really simple example here is, you know, I can use a story to, uh, uh, to sort of excuse myself for some behavior. I show up late to a meeting and I say, oh gosh, you know, the traffic was horrible and the world frustrated my attempts, my very virtuous attempts to get here on time. Uh, okay, I mean, maybe that story is true and if it's true, fine. Uh, but oftentimes it's not true, right? Oftentimes the real story, like the accurate story is, guys, I didn't care enough to get here on time. Like I, I looked at my alarm clock, I was like, ah, I'm sleeping. I'm going to risk it, you know, I didn't get here. And, and, uh, and now here I am, I'm late. I didn't care enough about, you know, our project together, whatever it might be. Uh, okay, so in thinking about the, the differences between those stories, right, and the, the ways that we use stories, and these are simple examples, but, you know, we, we use stories like this uh, in, in really profound ways sometimes to excuse ourselves or to take responsibility for things uh, that can sometimes really have a huge impact, can really hurt a relationship or, or you know, heal a relationship. Uh, this, this is something that, you know, you've just got to be able to do if you're going to be what, what we call uh, sort of a good agent, right? If you're going to have this philosophical skill of, of agency, of acting in the world in an effective way, but also in a way that allows you to sort of navigate these, these tricky relationships with other people and the good things that are at stake in those relationships. So um, one thing that I, I just, you know, as Megan was uh, uh, talking, uh, reminded me of is, um, you know, one resource that virtue ethicists have uh, in thinking about, you know, how, how we owe other people things and what we owe to other people is this idea of a common good. And the idea of a common good is, is the idea that we flourish, not individually, not just, just as people, right? It's not as though, like, if I achieve all my fitness goals and, like, you know, uh, write a book and, like, do whatever else I've always wanted to do, now I am flourishing, right? That's not true, because it could be that, like, my home life or my friendships or my professional network, whatever, are a disaster, right? We flourish in community with other people. And one of the things that allows us to do that is to get this skill of agency and to be able to take responsibility uh, when, you know, we are at fault or when we deserve credit for something. It's not just sort of a purely negative thing either. Um, so, I mean, this is one of the exciting ideas, I think, that comes out of uh, 20th century virtue ethics and, and Anscombe in particular. I just want to plug Anscombe as often as I can. Uh, and it, I, I think it's a really exciting, uh, uh, sort of very practical idea. Megan, in the last 10 years or so, Harvard psychologist Joshua Green and his colleagues have experimented to try and learn what's happening in our minds when we make moral decisions. What have they learned that stands out to you? I might actually pitch this over to Paul because he's our expert on situationism. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Uh, so there's a whole sort of school of thought right now in, in uh, psychology and social psychology, uh, and it's, it's come into ethics as well, called situationism, right? And the idea is that the situations we're in determine our actions to a much greater extent than we formerly thought, right? So whether or not you find a dime on the ground is going to influence whether or not you then help somebody who's in distress at the mall. And they do, you know, really interesting experiments about this. And they do show that external factors have a huge impact on, on our behavior. And I think it's really important to recognize that fact, right? Again, going back to, to the previous question, uh, if you don't recognize the ways in which, you know, the outside world is affecting your behavior and your action, you're, you're going to be self-deceived. You're going to think that you have more control over your life than you actually do. Now, Joshua Green in particular, um, he's got this neat experiment, right? Uh, he, he runs uh, an experiment where they bring people in 
and they give them a version of the trolley problem. The trolley problem is this really famous problem in ethics. The idea is there's a trolley coming down the tracks. You can you know, pull a lever and it's gonna switch tracks. It'll only kill one person or you don't do anything and it just goes down that track and it kills five people, right? It's, it's brutal. Like moral philosophy is for some reason really brutal. Uh, but he's, he shows you know, people this first example and then he shows them another example. He says, okay, would you pull, would you pull the switch or not? And a lot of people say, yeah, of course I'd pull the switch. I don't, I don't want five people to die. Second example, okay, the trolley's coming down the tracks. Now you have to push somebody in front of the train in order to stop the train. Should you do that, right? And a lot of people say, gosh, no, I, I don't think I would do that, right? Well, for Green and for a lot of situationists, they think, uh, well, this shows that as, as human beings, we're just irrational when it comes to making ethical decisions. Something as uh, sort of irrelevant as whether, you know, whether you've got to push somebody with your hands or pull a lever can change our decisions in a particular case. Now, one thing we do in the book is, is we challenge that interpretation. We say, look, uh, the particular sort of features, the particular facts in, in, in a case are actually gonna make a huge ethical difference, right? So whether you're pulling a switch and sort of indirectly, you know, deciding, look, I know this is gonna kill somebody. This is gonna have a consequence that I don't like, but I know it's gonna kill somebody versus actually like pushing an innocent person on the tracks, right? Uh, the way that we describe those is typically very different when it comes to the law, but also to ethics, right? Are you sacrificing a person? Are you murdering a person in order to save other people? Or are you doing something that has unintended consequences that are bad, right? And that are similar to these other consequences, uh, but that you don't, you don't intend, you don't want those consequences to come about. So for us, it's really important. And this, you know, goes all the way back to the sort of importance of storytelling uh, and particular details uh, in the moral life and, and why that's important. It's really important how you're describing uh, the moral decisions that you're making. And this is something that, that again, we bring up in the book because uh, we think it's really important to challenge this kind of, you know, in some ways, a, a dominant narrative uh, in some of the circles that, that we run in uh, where situationists think, well, no, this just proves like we're hopelessly morally biased. Like there's, there's no sort of, uh, you know, redeeming the moral decision-making we do because it's pretty random. And those are morally thick stories that you were just describing there, correct? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Morally thick story is one that uses concepts like virtue concepts, like generosity uh, or uh, selfishness or, you know, innocence, murder. They're, they're, you know, these great moral concepts that we have, they're really rich and they entail all kinds of things about the consequences, but also the inner life and the intentions of the agents. Uh, so that's what we mean when we say, you know, that a story or that a concept is morally thick. Love that. All right. Chapter four, the good life method is work with integrity. Megan, the advice that y'all give on work that appeals to the good life involves the values balance impact framework. The balance aspect includes finding the right mix between work and leisure. But how does that work for somebody like me where work is work, but play is also work too? Yeah, I think, you know, Paul and I worked on this as one of the last chapters as we were drafting the book. And it was during the pandemic, probably like early to middle pandemic, when everybody was just starting to realize, oh my gosh, I hate slash love remote work, or I have no boundaries anymore between my work and my dining room. Uh, so it felt, it felt like, you know, philosophy could speak into this moment, which then uh, we did not predict this has just grown bigger and uh more serious. I think a lot of folks who have the luxury of having a job right now also spend a fair bit of time getting advice, solicited or unsolicited, about how to balance that job with their quote unquote life. Uh, and a lot of this advice is, is really well meaning. It's, you know, how to draw boundaries, how to talk to your boss if things aren't going well. Um, how to understand how to move your life to the internet during a pandemic. That's all for the good. Hmm. But when it gets into this idea of giving you kind of a goal for what it is to be a flourishing person, which a lot of this advice also borders on preachy of like a really great person must turn off their phone at uh, 6 p.m. on Friday or a really good person and then insert like really specific work practice. Uh, when you start conflating the good life with these really specific capitalist 2022 work practices, then you're probably making a philosophical mistake. And one thing that, you know, we talk about in the book is if you reading through, read through the tradition, like Aristotle, like the Christian philosophers, especially the monastic philosophers who are thinking a lot about what it means to have a life's work, 
you realize pretty quickly that it's only a really small number of us that have these jobs that are structured by like punch the clock, show up at the office or the Zoom, punch out, go home. A lot of people have work that doesn't have that kind of capitalist time contained nature. A stay at home mom is a really good example of somebody who's like, she's got a job, she's got work that she's performing for the common good, but it doesn't have those temporal boundaries. An active duty military service person, somebody with a really serious cognitive disability who doesn't get paid for their work, but still has ways that they contribute to the common good and ways that they can fall short. These are all people that deserve to be part of our understanding of what it is to have meaningful work and how to know when work is going well or not. So one of the things that Paul and I do in the book is try to raise some virtue ethics questions for what seems like really well-meaning but kind of bullshit work-life advice that's everywhere right now. And to, to give to show people that you can think a little bit more philosophically about how these really very serious and real challenges we're facing at work um, can, can maybe start to be resolved by trying to connect them to these bigger philosophical challenges we're facing outside of work. Anything you'd like to add to that, Paul? Yeah, uh, so I think about work and the good life constantly. I'm teaching a class on it right now. Uh, and I guess I guess two quick thoughts. One is um, I find this notion of, of common goods, even though it's kind of abstract and it comes to us you know, uh, from a lot of different sources throughout the philosophical tradition, I find it incredibly illuminating and let me give you like a quick example to, to show how. So in the book, we talk about um, Airbnb and this particular case involving Airbnb. Uh, you know, uh, Airbnb is, is in some ways um, exemplary of this kind of commitment culture that's grown up in Silicon Valley, right? We don't want you to think about this as your job. This is your family, right? They actually call it the Air Fam. You become part of the Air Fam. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, on the one hand, it seems like this is a really sort of healthy corrective. Uh, to thinking about the workplace as, you know, this kind of machine-like arena where you come and you do your job and you're a cog in the wheel, okay, you leave. No, it's like, it's something that should engage every part of you, the whole person, right? You should be passionate about what you do. On the other hand, and, and, and I think sometimes these are unintended consequences, but I think they, you know, are, are things that you're seeing show up in a lot of writing right now. A lot of people are, are expressing this frustration. If you think about your work as a family, then you're going to apply certain morally thick concepts that, that maybe you shouldn't be applying to your work, right? Uh, I'm loyal to my family. I will never fire my son, no matter what he does or no matter how much I want to. He's, he's five right now, so he's, he's got a while before his next performance review, but I will <laughs> never fire him. I couldn't fire him, right? I am loyal to my son. Sometimes if you're in a workplace that's really heavily sort of commitment culture, uh, you know, we're a family, They'll ask you, they'll say, well, look, like, aren't you loyal to the mission? Like, why, why wouldn't you stay, you know, 12 hours a day and, and, and work or whatever it might be? And, and blurring those boundaries can be really frustrating, can be difficult. And I think it's something that, that, you know, in our culture, we're facing more and more, you know, because of all the different boundaries that are being blurred, because we can do our work on the internet or because, you know, I've got my iPhone and I can sort of send emails at 3 a.m. Um, so, so one way in which I think philosophy can help us think about work in the good life is, is by giving us those kinds of concepts, right? Is there a genuine common good? Is there a genuine community that I'm serving? Uh, and if so, what are my duties? What are my obligations to that community? Um, and I'm sort of, again, taking kind of the negative route here, but there, there are positive ways of thinking about that as well, right? You find yourself in a crisis, you're an essential worker, and you think, yeah, actually, like the morally thick uh, concepts here, they do apply. I've got to sort of give some of myself. I've got to sacrifice in order to serve the common good. The important thing is just being able to distinguish, okay, what's like a genuine common good? What's, what's a bullshitty common good? Um, so I, I find those kinds of concepts, and I think philosophy is, is just full of these, really illuminating and thinking about some of the issues that you're bringing up. Paul, I've got a five-year-old son at home as well. He tries to get himself fired all the time, but mom just <laughs> let it happen. My, my five-year-old literally said to me the other day, he goes, I quit. And he like walked out. I'm like, you quit what, sir? Like, <laughs> that's not an option. Oh, that's great. Chapter five of the Good Life Method is love attentively. Megan, what is the attentive mind as it relates to love? It's one of the other philosophers that maybe listeners haven't heard of, but we hope to, to introduce in the book because Paul and I both find her really powerful is Iris Murdoch. Uh, Murdoch was a 20th century philosopher. She was part of the Oxford and Cambridge system writing like after World War II. She's also a novelist. Some people know her. She wrote a lot of novels. 
but she was a Platonist. And one of her big contributions to philosophy in the last century was helping people connect what Plato tells us about learning how to see the truth with the way that we uh, care for other people. And this can sound a little bit mystical and new agey, and it's actually pretty, I, I find it pretty practical. It can be both those things. But Murdoch, uh, Murdoch says, first off, note how much of your time, and she's very confessional and self-reflective. She says, I think about how much of my time I spend resenting other people or just not caring about other people, like being able to pay attention to the people nearby in my orbit, like my immediate family or the people that I happen to be friends with, but then being pretty happy, just like totally ignoring other people or hating them, like actually feeling like my life is pretty good because I cultivate my uh, resentment of them. Um, you might think that loving other people have, being friends to other people, being a good neighbor is just a matter of what you do for or to other people. And this is, she says, a very consequentialist assumption. You can say like, am I a, a good sister to my sister-in-law? Well, do I remember her birthdays? Do I send her kind texts? Everything can be cataloged by my behavior towards my sister-in-law. And Murdoch says, no way. Uh, to think that all of love and the moral life is just a matter of your outward behavior is to completely miss the point about why love is such an important part of our life. Love is a part also of our inner lives. It's the way we think and see and visualize other people. And we can get stuck in caves when it comes to this. So we can be totally in the grips of really bad stories or really false views about other people that we allow to occupy our minds, even if they never change our outward behavior. Example that she get, that Murdoch gives that Paul and I think is uh, is pretty resonant in a lot of our own lives is the example of a mother of an adult son and the the son marries this woman and the mother does not like her new daughter in law she wants a good relationship with her son and she doesn't want to rock the boat so she's always like super polite and kind to her new daughter in law. But inwardly, she just rehearses all of these stories of like, I hate this woman. God, she's so like annoying. I can't believe I have to have dinner with her again. She just harbors this resentment. And the mother-in-law realizes she can't go on living this way. Like she doesn't want to be the kind of person that outwardly behaves kindly to her daughter-in-law, but inwardly despises her. And she realizes this is a, a, this is a way that she is falling short. So she works on uh, what Murdoch says uh, is this process of looking again. It's very platonic. It's like looking for the light. She makes herself keep uh, challenging her assumptions about her daughter-in-law and trying to think about her, tell a story about her in a new way. And uh, eventually it takes a while, but she makes progress and she learns to actually love her daughter-in-law by following this process. And Murdoch says, this woman has accomplished something. She, the, the mother has made her life better through this practice, even if the daughter-in-law never knew about this internal struggle at all. So in the book, we, we, we try to give you an alternative to thinking that love is just a matter of what you do for and to other people and show you ways that thinking philosophically about who you love and why you love them and who you don't love and why you don't love them might help you actually expand your love life. Well, Megan, y'all provide a wonderful list of questions that the reader can ask those that they love or those that they hope to love to get to know them better and to provide that proper attention. Do you have a favorite question to ask those that you love to get them know, get to know them better? Paul, do you want to go first? Paul, Paul's actually done this at length with his wife, whereas I'm, I always, I'm afraid to do it with my family. I'm trying. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm, uh, this is kind of in the weeds. I'm, I'm an epistemologist, right? So in philosophy, I study knowledge and belief. I'm fascinated by the things people believe. So I'll often ask people, uh, you know, half jokingly, either, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the sort of most controversial thing that you believe? Or uh, what's a conspiracy that you believe that you think is actually true? And I find, you know, if you can establish the level of trust that's actually required to answer that honestly, and that's a hard thing to do, right? Like, I'm not just going to, like, tell anybody, like, a conspiracy I actually believe. I'll be shunned. But if you can establish that, uh, you get incredible insight into the experiences of people, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the, the follow-up questions for me are always like, well, why? How did you come to that view, Right. Uh, and often somebody will say something that I just totally disagree with, like, what's a true conspiracy? And they'll be like, ah, oh, this medical thing, yeah, whatever. I'll just be like, all right, you know, we could just end it there. Or I could be like, you know, I disagree. Uh, but I always follow up and I always say like, well, like, what, why? Like, what in your life led you to this belief? 
And again, if you've got that kind of vulnerability, and this is some, this is a conversation I've literally had with my mom, you suddenly are given an insight into their world. There's an experience that shaped them that just tells you something about them, about their life. Uh, and that allows you to see like, okay, even if I still at the end totally disagree, and a lot of times that's where our conversations actually end, I, I suddenly see, oh, this is like revelatory. This is this is important. It's it's drawing on a value and often one that I actually share, right? And I say like, well, there's something we can agree on, right? Um, so so th that's one of my favorite ones. Uh, gosh, yeah, I don't know. Megan, do you have- We, you have we reproduced this- uh this extraordinarily popular article in the New York Times from a couple of years ago that's 36 questions that lead to love. And the the kind of secret is the questions start off really anodyne, like, Trey, tell me a little bit about the best meal you've had in the last year. But then they escalate into like riskier and riskier. So like, Trey, tell me something you wish other people would know about you, but you've never told anyone in your life. <laughs> um, they, they escalate in like the kind of vulnerability and your, your ability to know this about another person. Um, and as I said, like my, you know, my family hates having philosophy done on them. So I have to be very sophisticated when I want to get into this, these kind of love building questions with them. Um, but uh, occasionally, if, especially if they're kind of relaxed, like it's been a pleasant dinner, we've gotten through all the small talk. I think questions about my parents' history with their own families, like, you know, what's something that, um, that uh, you think your mom and dad did really badly? Um, that, that has shaped your view about how to be a good parent. Uh, I've had that conversation. That's not one you just launch into like in the Starbucks line after five minutes, but it's one like if the, if the kind of vulnerability and trust is growing, that, can, that has, in our case, led to really interesting questions, like conversations about how my parents started to get their vision of what it meant to be a good parent. Um, and and as, their, as their child, then I learned that about them. And it's like, it totally colors how I tell the story about my own childhood. Uh, so I like questions that's like, tell me, they start off with like, tell me a story about like when you had a big doubt about grandma's decision-making as a mom. <laughs> um, wow. and, and they're probably not expecting it, but if they're open to it, something cool is going to happen. That's a phenomenal question. I love the conspiracy question too, cons uh, conspiracy theory question. Now, what is each of your favorite conspiracy theory? You don't have to go into detail. Just what is your favorite conspiracy theory? And Paul, we'll start with you. Oh my gosh. I love it. You know, ever since I was a, like a little kid, this is a weird thing to be into, but I was really, sorry, it's very dark too. I was really into the Lincoln assassination. And I like, I would go to the public library. I remember going to the public library uh, and, and they had like conspiracy theorists come in and talk about like, ah, oh, like here's all the different empirical facts. I was fascinated by that. I was fascinated by that whole story. Um, so I mean, gosh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I certainly wouldn't say like, I think there's a conspiracy there. That's true. I don't know. Uh, enough about the history of this is like going way back. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's certainly one that like I've, I've been thinking about for a long time since I was literally a kid. As a Dallas native, I'm fascinated by the JFK assassination. So I get it. Megan, how about you? I am very loss averse in ways that like I'm aware of and I try to resist. But when uh, when a famous person who I think is really cool dies, I'm totally a sucker for the conspiracy theory that they're not really dead. So like I remember when I was young and found out that Tupac Shakur had uh, had died, I still don't quite believe it. It's like, no, he's just, he just went into hiding. He's away, but he's happy and don't worry about it. I probably feel that way about Betty White right now. It's like, there's no way she died because that's just not how the universe works. So she's probably with Tupac right now and they're happy. They're making beautiful art and they just needed a break. And so any of those conspiracy theories that uh, start with, person X whom I admire is not really dead. Um, you know, there's a part of my soul that leaps and they're just like, mm -hmm, that's probably right. Well, I think <laughs> you and I are of a similar age and the Tupac thing made a ton of sense just because the Machiavelli album that he put out right before yeah. he died too, right? It all fits together. And it's totally <laughs> like, you know, it's totally Tupac to do something like that. So of course, that's the story that I prefer and I'm sticking with it. Chapters six through nine deal mostly with God, uh, starting with chapter six, wonder about God. Paul, what is God? Oh my, that is that is a question. That's quite a question. So here, here's how I'll start. I'll, I'll make a distinction between um, the God of the, the philosophers and the God of, you know, sort of traditional theology. Uh, and this is something, you know, uh, uh, when we start talking about God, it's really important that I, that I start this way with my students. 
uh, because the God of the philosophers is a God that is pretty abstractly construed, right? And it's not as though, you know, we're thinking about literally like different gods, multiple gods. We're thinking about a God under a certain description. Uh, and that description is as omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and omniscient, right? A God who knows everything, can do anything, uh, and is all good, right? Would never will anything evil. Now, one thing that's really cool about this definition is one that goes, you know, all the way back uh, in, in traditions of Christian philosophy and others is that you can do a lot of natural theology. You can think really seriously about the supernatural, about the divine, uh, when you just posit that God has these three properties or these three features. So one of the things that we do in the book is, you know, we take on this ancient problem, this problem that people have been thinking about forever, uh, of whether any being with those properties could exist, given the kind of suffering and evil that we see in the world, right? Uh, it seems pretty obvious as a parent, right, that if, if my son is suffering in a preventable way, that's not building character, that's not good for him in any sort of way, uh, I would stop that, right? I have the capacity to do it. I know it's happening. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop that from happening. Well, it seems just, you know, by looking around at the world, like there is massive amounts of suffering. I mean, it doesn't just seem that way. There is massive amounts of suffering, but it can seem like uh, that suffering is totally uh, gratuitous, totally unjustifiable from the perspective of a being that could and would want to stop it, right? And so one of the big sort of challenges, one of the big problems that, that uh, philosophers who are also committed to believing in the existence of God have faced for many years is how to explain it and whether we should try to explain it, right? Uh, there's something I've always found, there's something almost offensive about a philosopher who comes in and says like, well, actually, uh, all suffering is justified. And you're like, really? Like this suffering, this massive suffering, you know, you can point to particular instances. And so there's just, there's really delicate questions there, right? And there's really hard questions, uh, but ones that I think are, are certainly worth thinking about, um, if only because, you know, uh, uh, your picture of, of God's relationship to that suffering is really going to change the way that you think about God uh, uh, himself, right? I mean, it certainly does uh, in my case, right? Um, so that's that's the, the way that we're thinking about God, that we're reasoning about God uh, in the book. Um, yeah. One, one of the things that's really important, and this is how we teach philosophy as well, people come to the religion question from lots of different starting points. You might have been raised in a particular religion. You might have been raised in a religion and then rejected it. You might not know anything about these particular world religions. When Paul and I teach on these topics as philosophers, the way we introduce the philosophy of religion to our students is not trying to show them mathematical proofs that God exists or doesn't, or to try to convert them to a particular religion or not. I mean, Paul and I are both Catholics, but I don't have like a tally sheet in my uh, in my office for how many students end up agreeing more with me about Catholicism at the end. I don't think Catholicism is something it's good to like agree with. It's not it's not joining a political party. It's a way of life. Um, but we try to show students that. Uh, starting to ask these kind of mundane moral questions like how much money should I give to my kids and how much money should I give to other people's kids in the South Sudan? How much time should I spend in this kind of job and why did I choose this kind of job rather than full-time prayer, which some people choose as their job. Some people join monasteries. How am I going to explain to my kids someday what happens when, uh, when people die and why life is so short? Those kinds of day-to-day uh, -day practical questions about how to live inevitably get us interested in why am I religious or why am I not religious? And what would it mean for somebody like me to be religious? Um, and those are also questions that philosophy can help give us answers to. Uh, they're not gonna, anybody who says they, on purely philosophical grounds, became Jewish or joined the Catholic church is probably missing the point of those religions, which are not meant to be things that you kind of do a philosophical deduction and then sign on to. But for a lot of people managing this strategy for, uh, for understanding why they're here and what their goal in life is, uh, religion has been a really important middle and end part for filling out that picture. And so as philosophers, we've got to do that justice. Chapter nine of the good life method is contemplate your purpose. Paul, why do you invoke stoicism and Marcus Aurelius in this chapter? One of the cool things I think uh, about our contemporary culture is that stoicism is, is kind of having a moment. Like there's just uh, a lot of pop stoicism out there. 
uh, and actually I did a, a bit of a dive into this a, a while back because, you know, philosophers, like any academics, we're kind of grumpy sometimes. We're like, as soon as something gets popular, we're like, eh, not cool anymore. I guess we're like, like intellectual hipsters or something. Uh, but with, with Stoicism, one thing that's funny is that the original sort of Roman version of Stoicism is actually already a sort of popularized version of a Stoicism that came before it, right, in Greek and Roman traditions. Uh, and, and Marcus Aurelius is a great sort of example uh, of, of how this happened and, and why it happened, right? So Marcus Aurelius, he's an emperor, he's a Roman emperor, he's, uh, you know, combating a, a plague, a pandemic, uh, and leading uh, an army, sort of trying to, to you know, conquer uh, all of these other peoples. And uh, he, he writes this book called uh, Meditations, right? Uh, and in this book, he's, he's writing down all of these kind of cryptic, axiomatic, sort of um, uh, just paragraphs or even sometimes just a couple of sentences. And if you know his history, uh, you might expect that these things would be like, you know, conquered another army today or like, ah, oh, gosh, plague is really getting bad. He didn't talk about any of that stuff, right? He didn't talk about the actions of his life at all. He's talking about his inner life, what's going on inside. And he's writing these as notes to himself to remind himself that that's what really actually matters, right? So for the Stoic, and these are substantive commitments, right? And, and, and ones that we might agree with, we might disagree with, but for the Stoic, focusing too much on things in the outside world is dangerous because those things are often outside of our control. If I make the whole point and purpose of my life to make a billion dollars before I die, there's a very good chance that I will be wildly unhappy, right? Because I do not have direct control over whether or not that's going to happen. So instead, what the Stoics say is they say, well, focus inward. Why? Well, because your inner life is just as important. In fact, it's more important because that's where you can cultivate the kinds of virtues, the loving attention that we're talking about, the generosity uh, that actually constitute a good life. The way that we talk about it in the book is, uh, you know, as, as crafting your soul, right? Crafting sort of the most important, most valuable part of your life. Now, one thing that's fascinating is that this is, is, you know, a philosophical system that they came up with and they would write these little axioms and, you know, you read the meditations and it, you know, it's like, ah, uh, think about fruit and how it's best right before it's rotten. And then like, that's supposed to remind you that like, look, like people are going to die and that's okay because like their life is full and okay, whatever. Like these are the kinds of things, right? But, but, but meditating on these things by using that to be more mindful, intentional, reflective, the Stoics actually predicted and, and sort of, you know, anticipated by thousands of years, a lot of current psychological techniques that, that people find empirically work incredibly well, right? So cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness, the kind of uh, meditation that you can do on, on these apps like Headspace and things like that, uh, a lot of them have this very similar structure, which is just very striking to me, right? That, that they were able to kind of like uh, discover this uh, uh, just by reflecting about the world and their inner experience, and then by actually doing these things, right? Um, I think the last thing I'll, I'll say about this, I promise. I think the last, the, the, the other thing that's really fascinating about stoicism and, and, and contemplation is, is the very idea that a contemplative life is an option or a goal. So in our culture, in our society, and I talk about this with my students all the time, there's such this, like, like this, this hustle mentality, which I totally buy into and I love because I feel like, you know, doing things all the time, like it, it gives you this feeling of meaning and it is very meaningful often. But we've sort of lost this very important tradition, which has been present throughout all of the history of philosophy, which is that uh, we have this capacity to do this other thing, to contemplate, right? And you think like, well, what is that? And you, you read Aristotle, you read, you know, Joseph Pieper, you read some of these people that actually describe contemplation. And it is as weird as it sounds, right? It's like, it's like communing with reality. It's like becoming one with the flower or the tree or something like that. Uh, but the Stoics give you this way of practically kind of implementing that in your life. And I found that once you start doing that, there's something there, right? And it's not just kind of a feeling of, of peace and calm and relaxation. It is that. But it's something beyond that where you think like, gosh, like they, they're just, there is a way in which, uh, um, you know, contemplating the world, being in touch with reality is sort of consonant with our nature. It's part of our function. I don't know. Sorry, that part got mystical sounding. Uh, but I absolutely, I absolutely love it. And I love Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics for making it really practical. No, that last part speaks to one of my favorite lines in the book. Contemplation is pointless. And that's the point. Megan, is there a good starting point for those who want to add contemplation to their life? 
I think uh, we'll give you a piece of negative advice and then a piece of an experiment to try out. So here's the piece of negative advice. Most of the like apps and internet things that try to encourage you to pursue contemplation, and this includes a lot of that internet stoicism that Paul mentioned, treat contemplation as like a hack for achieving your action goals faster. So you think like, I really want to, uh, to make it to the Olympics in two years. Uh, LeBron James tells me to like use this meditation app for 30 minutes and then get in the ice bath and that's gonna increase my Olympic performance. That's to misunderstand contemplation. Like the only way to get to the Olympics, the only way to write a book, the only way to advance in your career is as Paul said, to hustle. Like you need to do those things to hit those accomplishments. Um, and contemplation, contemplation might calm you down a little bit to be willing to do what it really takes to accomplish those things. But that's not the point of contemplation. The point of contemplation is like contemplation itself. It's not meant to be an enhancement on some other real action goal that you have. So that's the negative advice. If you're, if you're involved in apps or programs that are treating contemplation as just a performance enhancer, from a philosophical standpoint, you're missing the point. Uh, but then what is it to try to practice contemplation for its own sake? The advice that we give in the book is uh, you might try out some like prayer reflection activities that the Stoics tried out and found to be like good at getting them in the mood for contemplation or that uh, Jesuits have tried. You know, we introduced the examine prayer. And even if you're not a, a Christian or particularly a religious person, you might find this practice helpful. It's just setting a little bit of time aside at the end of your day to kind of revisit the story of your day in different frames. First, kind of looking at areas uh, first, looking at just what actually happened and how you describe how your day has gone. Second, looking at areas where you kind of screwed up and you need to take moral responsibility for something you did. And sometimes we don't realize that even until after the fact. You were a huge jerk to that person on email. You probably need to get some like forgiveness for that. Then you kind of replay the day again in your mind, but you look for moments of grace or things that you might have missed in, at the time, but were actually really beautiful. And if you're a religious person, you think, man, like, God was there in that interaction in the coffee shop, and I didn't even realize it at the time. And then finally, you kind of reflect and think about what you hope you've learned from this day that you can kind of store up in the person that you are. And this is an activity, it's really robust. We didn't invent it. It's turned out that like just lots of people learn about this from Jesuits all around the world. And they think like, I want to give this a shot. <laughs> um, and you don't do it so that, uh, I mean, it might help you avoid those same mistakes tomorrow. But the main point of it is to kind of just extract what was really wonderful about today. Um, and so trying out those activities, a lot of them are older and that's because they've had this like staying power. Um, but, but we think they're, uh, they're totally worth it. And I guess one other piece of advice, a lot of people think contemplation is something you got to do by yourself. Um, like you got to sit and turn all the lights off and like turn on the essential oil machine. Uh, if that works for you, go for it. But a lot of philosophers have found that like contemplative activities can also be just conversations about these things. Like, what do you think happened yesterday? Let's go through it in these different ways. They're, they're things that we do with other people. And so if you, find, if you find this to be kind of lonely, these activities, don't worry, there are plenty of stoic and Christian con contemplative activities that you can do with people that you love and your friends. Fantastic advice. Thank you for that. And chapter 10 of the Good Life Method is prepare for death. This leads us to our final question, which I'd like both of you to answer. Paul, we'll start with you here. How have you prepared for death? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think one of the really important uh, things that death brings into view is what you take to be essential to living a good life, right? There's this really ancient practice uh, of recalling the moment of your death. You call it like it's called memento mori, right? You might even just like uh, you might say it to yourself. Uh, there's this um, myth. It's not actually true. I looked into it because I thought it'd be fascinating if it was true. But this myth that you know in in monasteries in in the Middle Ages there was a monk that would walk around and whisper to each of the monks like memento mori, like remember the moment of your death. Uh, but it is it is this idea, right? And, and and sometimes people will have little tokens that remind them of this. And I think what's, what's really um, important about this, or, or the kind of truth that it points out, is that, uh, you know, death doesn't rob us of, of all of the things in life that we think are, are good, uh, and, uh, or maybe the, the way to put it is um, uh, thinking about um, what you value most in life, uh, thinking about death can bring out what you most value in life. So let me give you an example. 
So um, Socrates, right, uh, he's on trial in the Apology. We're going all the way back to the beginning of the book. He's on trial in the Apology. And he's on trial for corrupting the youth. You can see the, the sign behind Megan here. Uh, corrupting the youth is the charge they brought against him. They said, look, you're walking around Athens. You're asking these questions that are really inconvenient and politically divisive, right? Like they're, they're dividing people. Uh, and the youth are, are, you know, starting to get skeptical about the gods and about all these things. You, you've got to stop doing this, right? You've got to stop asking these questions, right? Now he's saying, I'm just doing this because I'm pursuing the truth, right? And they say, well, you've got two options. You can either stop asking questions, you can stop pursuing the truth, or you can die, right? There's capital punishment uh, for the thing you're doing. And Socrates says, I would rather die than not pursue the truth, right? Because a life in which I can't pursue the truth is not worth living. Aristotle really famously says, and I think this is a really beautiful passage, uh, that you know, no man would choose to live uh, a good life without friends, though he had every other good, right? You can imagine a life where you've got material wealth, you've got health, you've got everything else, if you don't have friends, you wouldn't choose that life. You would rather choose a life without those things in which you had friends than a life in which you had all those things. So I think one of the things that, that death just sort of sharpens in your mind is, you know, what is it that you really value in life? What, what is it that you care about in life? And does the way that you're living reflect that or not, right? If, if you think like, look, you know, thinking about death really reveals to me that, you know, whatever it might be, that, that my friendships are the things that I care most about. But if I'm not prioritizing that, if my life is not actually uh, aligned in that way, then you're going to experience a kind of dissonance, right? The kind of dissonance and anxiety uh, that the skeptic or that the Stoics uh, uh, are, are constantly worried about. And that actually, you know, their exercises are meant in some ways uh, to help you mitigate, right? Because you're reminding yourself, no, it is actually this thing that I value, right? I shouldn't be, you know, doing whatever else. This is the thing that I should be doing and refocusing on. So for me, that's that's one of the values that reflecting on death can actually have just in the present moment, right? Uh, even if you're like 34, 36, I don't know how old I am. Even if you're like in your 30s, right? And you hope that death is, is, is sort of far off, try to project yourself into that moment and just sort of, you know, bringing up this memento mori idea, this, this recalling the moment of your death. Uh, it can have a practical impact on the way that you just live day to day. Megan, how about you? Yeah, I think on my end, and talk, we talk a little bit about this uh, tension in the final chapter of the book, the, the Greek and Roman philosophers and some Christian philosophers have thought that philosophy could make us not fear death or like take out death's sting from our life, like help us realize that death is not a bad thing. Uh, and that's certainly not been its effect of studying philosophy on me. I, I think death is awful. Um, and not even just thinking about my own death, which is a little scary, but thinking about losing people that I really care about, it's pretty hard, a uh, good life challenge. It's the ultimate challenge to our conception of whether our lives are meaningful. And that, that deserves to be taken with a certain amount of seriousness. I think one thing that I've been reflecting on a lot in the last year, I'm 39 and I just seem to be entering this phase in the last year where people that I'm close to, uh, are getting serious cancer diagnoses um, or who are losing people that aren't like distant grandparents, but are people my age who are in the middle of life. And you find yourself in this situation as, um, as a friend to somebody who's going through that of trying to think of the appropriate way to talk about it with them. And certainly if you're a philosophy professor, people expect you to have something really great to say. And I noticed that reflecting on what I, what I really value in life itself and thinking about what the goals are ultimately in life has, uh, has not made me any less afraid of dying and other people's death, but has made me like more confident in my ability to go there with people who are really suffering. So, you know, you find out that, um, that a friend has a really serious cancer diagnosis. And a couple of years ago, before I really started working on this book or before we started working on the class, I probably would have like Googled what's a nice thing to say to your friend when they got a cancer diagnosis and tried to like get it out of the way and then look away. Um, and now I find that I'm able to, to spend a lot more attention and ask the right kinds of questions being like, you know, gosh, you know, Trey, it must feel really awful for, for you not to think about the pain of treatment, but to think about what this is doing to your son. Um, and, and to be able to like talk about how I could to be able to empathize, but in a really deep way with somebody who's going through one of these big crises. Mm. So I think philosophy, like having, having your own philosophical house in a bit of order and having wrestled with these questions, it's probably not going to mute their sting. It has not in my life, but it has made me much more available to other people who are, who are walking that road right now that we're all going to face down the way. 
Fantastic answers from you both. She is Megan Sullivan, the Wilsey Family College Professor in Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame and Director of the God and the Good Life Program. Paul Blaschko is an Assistant Teaching Professor in Philosophy at Notre Dame, and he heads up the Curriculum Design and Digital Pedagogy for the God and the Good Life Program. Together, they just co-authored the excellent new book, The Good Life Method, Reasoning Through the Big Questions of Happiness, Faith, and Meaning. Get it now wherever books are sold. Thank you both so much for the time today, and thank you for this wonderfully enlightening book. Yeah, Thanks, thank Greg. you. Join me next time when I speak with actor Ty Sheridan on the new Amazon Prime film, The Tinder Bar, directed by George Clooney. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day. Good day.